All right. So here we are. Um, we are on page 12B3. And uh, we've continued to uh, um, work on you know, the verses and phrase by phrase, um, the, uh, um, the verses in the Megillah. And the verse that we're on is Ish Yehudi haya b'shushan habira u'shmo Mordechai ben Yoyeh ben Shimi ben Kish Ish Yemini, right? So that that's it's it's sort of uh, uh, quoted for us in on the right hand side, twelve B three, the right hand side, um, after the first paragraph, and the full text is uh, in note forty nine. So we looked at uh, the the paragraph that's after that. And we said, uh, oh, what a wonderful um, uh, man this man was. Uh, each, of the, uh, each of the names of his uh, uh, um, ancestors, right? Where it says he was the son of Yair, the son of Shimi, the son of Kish. Um, they read it as actually being him. You know, that, that he is... You know, we, we say the other way around, right? We say, uh, you know, an SOB or a son of a gun. You know, uh, um, the way they're reading it, uh, he's a son of a yair, right? Which means he's a person who's shedding light on the world. He's really wonderful, right? Uh, and uh, uh, the um, Ben Shimi, he's the son of, of uh, a person who got, got to, uh, to uh, listen to uh, his prayers. And uh, he knocked on the on the doors of uh, of mercy for on behalf of the Jews. So these are all being uh, homiletically uh, read, not as these are the generations of his ancestors before him, but rather just uh, words of praise about about Mordechai. But now we're going to get into understanding it in the straightforward way. In the straightforward way, this is Mordechai, who's then given you know three generations of lineage before that and the Gemara wants to understand um, where do we place him the Gemara expounds an apparent contradiction who's going to read for us very quiet so should we just do silent reading for the next uh, two hours you're not you're muted I think yep, no. yep. yeah that was a trick sorry yeah, good trick all right, thanks. Thanks for stepping up. Go ahead. Okay. Last paragraph on the right hand side, 12b3. The Gemara expounds an apparent contradiction in this verse. The verse calls him Judahite. Thus, we see that he came from the tribe of Judah. Yet it calls him Benjaminite at the very end of at the end of that very verse. Thus, we see that he came from the tribe of Benjamin, which was his actual tribe. Rav Nachman said Mordecai was crowned with names. That is the honorable names of both his father and mothers and mother's tribes, as the Gemara now explains. Okay, so, so we're going to get to that explanation in a second, but let's first look at note 56. Note 56. Rashi. So the the um, question is, first it's called Ish Yehudi, and then he's called Ish Yemini. So Yemini means right-handed right, right -handed or, you know, on the right but it's short for Binyamin, Yamin. right? Binyamin is Benjamin, the son of the right, right? The son of the right side. That was Benjamin's name. So is he Ishudi? Is he a, a person of Judah, Yehuda, or is he a person of Binyamin? So Rashi. Rashi observes that there is a simple resolution to this contradiction. The term Yehudi can be interpreted in a general sense to refer to all Jews even to members of tribes other than Judah, since they were exiled with the kings of Judah. This usage is common throughout the Megillah and in other books of scripture. Thus, Mordecai is called a Judahite, from which the term Jew is derived, yet he actually came from the tribe of Benjamin. The Gemara, however, wishes to expound the verse midrashically. Right. So the Gemara wants to use this as an opportunity to say some other wonderful things. But the truth is, as Rashi says, and we should just take note of this, this is when the word Jew first comes into uh, usage. Um, the fact that we are called Jews, um, the word Jew is not 
used to describe uh, Jews uh, in the Torah. What are we called in the Torah? Israelites. Right, Israelites, which means literally children of Israel, yeah. right? B'nai Yisrael, the sons of Israel. The I-T-E, Ait, is, is son of. So um, we're called, you know, children of Israel. We're called Jews only much later, only after the destruction of the first temple, and mostly actually with the restoration of the second commonwealth. And here it says they, that the reason is because we were all exiled, uh, even members of other tribes were exiled with the kings of Judah. That's okay, but the real truth is because the other tribes as identifiable tribes disappeared. And the only identifiable tribes were Levi and Judah. Benjamin disappeared. Benjamin was swallowed up into Judah. That happened uh, already even before, but the fact, the fact that Mordechai is identifiable as a Benjaminite is actually noteworthy, but, um, and it's important for the, for the the biblical sacred history that is being told. Um, but uh, Benjamin basically faded away and the other 10 tribes were dispersed hundreds of years before and we lost track of them. And they did not maintain their own identity uh, the way the Jews have maintained their identity to this day. So they historically just mixed in, they assimilated. Um, so they are no longer known. The only Jewish people, the only Israelite people, let's put it that way, the only Israelite people that has stuck through history are Judahites or anybody who lived with Judahites and specifically those Levites, and that includes the priests, the Kohanim, who were in Judahite territory. Priests and Levites that were living with the 10 tribes, and there were plenty of them, disappeared. So we have only a remnant, right? We talk about the remnants um, uh, of, uh, of the Jews, and that happens again and again and again in history. But whenever we have further remnants, remnants of the Spanish uh, 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 exile, remnants of the Shoah, um, we're actually all remnants of remnants. This is the first, uh, you know, uh, uh, situation Ooh. that the Jewish people, as the Jewish people, quote unquote, that's already a a label about a a small remnant of a much larger people, the rest of which has gotten lost in one way or another. So that's really what's happening here. Mordechai is called Ish Yehudi, and that's an editorial comment, right? This is a person who, of course, in the story of the Megillah, what, is, what does he say? he say? He says to Haman, I'm not bowing down to you. I'm a Jew, right? So his self-identification is very important to the story. Um, his identification as a Benjaminite is also important to the story. Does anybody remember why that might be? So let's think again about Benjamin and Judah. What do we know about the significance of Judah besides the fact that that's the only surviving tribe? He, he tried to, um, to save yeah. Joseph. Yeah, yeah, no, not going backwards. As a tribe, mm -hmm. as a tribe later on, not as an individual Judah, but Judah as the tribe of Judah, oh, Judah, what's important about that tribe? They are the tribe of royalty. They yeah. are the tribe of, yeah. of the monarchic family. The monarchic family has to come from Judah, has to come from the house of David. So Judah is the uh, uh, family of the kings. What about Benjamin? Benjamin was the original family of the kings. Benjamin is the tribe of Saul. So Saul was the original appointed king. 
And that would have meant that Benjamin would have been the tribe. Had Saul established a dynasty, Benjamin would have been the dynastic tribe. But Benjamin loses that uh, status. Why? Because Saul fails to, to exterminate Amalek. Saul was given the job to, to destroy Amalek, and he doesn't do it. He, he, he defeats them in battle, but he doesn't utterly destroy them. And Samuel comes to him and says, what's going on? And it's a heartbreaking story. We're not going to revisit it right now. But then he tears away the kingship from him. And he says, and, and he's crying. God says to Samuel, you have to do this. And Samuel doesn't want to do it. But Samuel does it. And he says, you've lost your right to be the king. So Saul and Benjamin, as the tribe, lose the monarchy because they were not vicious enough to finish the job against Amalek. What is the story of Purim? The story of Purim is Haman is Amalek. Haman is given his own pedigree. He goes back to the king of Amalek that Saul didn't kill. Haman the Agagite, right? Haman Ha'agagi. Agag was the king of, uh, um, of the Amalekites that Saul re re refused to kill. So this is part of, as I say, the sacred history where Benjamin gets one more chance to uh, make up for what they messed up uh, earlier. Um, that's the kind of symmetry that's going on in, in, uh, in the way this works out. So that's the way the verse can be read um, you know, on its own. Now the Gemara wants to add other layers. So now we're on um, 12b4 and uh, left hand side. Ama Rabba, Rabba, Barbar Khana. Third line. No, I can't hear you. Sorry. Rabbi, Rabbi Bar Barchana said in the name of Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi, Mordechai's father was from the tribe of Benjamin and his mother was from the tribe of Judah. Although one's origin is generally not expressed in terms of his mother's tribe, this was done in the case of Mordechai in order to honor him. And the rabbi said, the families of Judah and Benjamin would vie with one another for the credit of Mordechai's birth. The family, that is the tribe of Judah would say, I caused that Mordecai be born, for King David, a scion of Judah, refrained and did not kill Shimi ben Gera, who was an ancestor of Mordecai. And the family, that is the tribe of Benjamin, said, he is in fact descended from me. Okay. Um, so the, uh, we have here a, uh, an imaginary uh, uh, you know, uh, scene of collaboration and also a little rivalry between the tribes. Um, and we have um, a little glancing um, acknowledgement uh, that we have a little bit of a, of a you know, tension between associating Mordechai with his father or with his mother. The way that they put it here, the mother's tribe one second, please. Sorry. One second. Hi, John. I'm in the middle of teaching. Hello? John? Okay. We're back, right? Can you hear me? Good. Why can't I hear anybody else? So everybody's on mute. Because we're, so, we're following these yeah, questions. Yeah, good, 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 good. yeah, 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 yeah. Very good. So we have here that, that his mother's tribe is Judah and his father's tribe is Benjamin. Okay. So normally 
what would that mean? How would we identify the person? As a Benjaminite, your tribal affiliation follows your father. If you're a Kohen, why are you a Kohen? Because your father was a Kohen, Kohen. right? Everybody remembers that wonderful joke, <laughs> right? Yes. Okay, some people are nodding their heads. No, but some people are shaking their heads. So a person comes, person comes to the rabbi and says, Rabbi, I want you to make me into a Kohen. Here's $10,000. And the rabbi says, I'm cutting the joke short. Um, so the rabbi says, well, $10,000, it's pretty serious. I guess maybe I could try to see what I could do. You know, uh, I make you into a into a coin, all right? I mean, uh, but just I, I'll I'll do the best I can. But just tell me, why is this so important to you? And the guy goes, "My father was a coin. My grandfather was a coin. I'll be damned if I won't be a coin." So uh, the rabbi was greatly relieved, uh, pocketed the ten thousand dollars, and then said, "Poof, you're a coin." So. Um, so the father's uh, pedigree is what determines your own. And uh, so this begs the question, why is Mordechai's mother's tribal affiliation uh, accounted for at all? So the answer here is that, well, it's sort of like giving him extra credit. Um, but, um, and then we have uh, other stuff that we have to look at. What I want to suggest is that this is also um, a residue of um, a change in Jewish history in terms of pedigree determination. It's true that throughout the, uh, um, the biblical uh, uh, period, certainly the Torah uh, uh, times, um, everything followed the father, right? So if you were, you know, if your father was Benjamin, you were Benjamin. If your father was Yehuda, you were Yehuda, et cetera, et cetera, Kohen and so on. But when we get to Ezra, which is the time of the return of the Jews to the land of Israel and the beginning of a second commonwealth, a second try at reestablishing a, uh, a Jewish homeland and a Jewish uh, freely functioning society. We have what's, and this is scholars debate this, but, but I think that this is what makes the most sense. We have a, a very, very important decision that we have been living with until modern times, until this generation where it's starting to get shaken up a little bit. And that is that we switch from a patrilineal determination of, of uh, descent, of Jewish identity, to a matrilineal determination of Jewish uh, identity. So we see this with Ezra and Nehemiah presiding over a mass uh, um, you know, uh, uh, upheaval where people who had married non-Jewish women have to get rid of the non-Jewish women if they want to be part of the community. And if you work according to simple biblical, uh, earlier biblical models, there shouldn't be any problem. If Jewish men marry non-Jewish women, they're the, the determiners of status. All their children should be Jews. And there shouldn't be any threat to the Jewish people. But Ezra and Nehemiah determined that that's not the way the reality was playing out. And that the uh, Jewish men could not continue to marry non-Jewish women and stay in the community because de facto, what would happen would be that the community would, would fall apart. So there they made the decision that no, Jewish identity follows according to who the mother is. And you have to have a, a, a mother who is Jewish to be considered automatically Jewish. Obviously, there's such a thing as conversion. But um, in terms of the line of Jewish identity, the switch 
happens at that point to a uh, matrilineal determination. And of course, that also happens to be at a time when there's no more tribal identifications, pretty much. Where do we still keep patrilineal determination? With the priest and the Levite, right? That depends on who your father is. So on that little tribal identification issue, we still preserve the old time policy of patrilineal descent. But when it comes to basic identity as a Jew, we've switched it. We switch it at about that time. And Mordechai is in that gray area after the, uh, the uh, destruction of the first temple. Uh, he's in exile, he's in Persia, but he's trying to stick up for a Jewish identity. And the issues become, uh, you know, complex in our own day, the last generation, um, the reform movement and the reconstructionist movement have decided to have it both ways. That patrilineal descent is also possible as a determiner of Jewish identity. They make it according, but you have to be raising the kid consciously to be only Jewish. Um, but that's actually, practically speaking, certainly in, in, in many, many cases, not really abided by. And they simply, simply, they simply say that, no, you know, if, if, you, if your father's Jewish, and uh, then you're Jewish, even if your mother isn't Jewish. Um, there's a lot of pressure these days to, to uh, adopt that idea, because again, of the reality, because, uh, you know, intermarriage is, is uh, um, a fact of life now. And what are we supposed to do about it? The conservative movement struggles with this now very, very, very uh, hard. The Orthodox movement doesn't want to have anything to do with it. Um, uh, so um, that's where we are today. We're in a very, very, uh, you know, uh, stressful situation when it comes to determining Jewish identity. So first Merle, then Josie. Um, I remember in one, I might have been Melton, you know, we were talking about who's a Jew <clears throat> and, uh, or, or maybe, I think that's what we were talking about. Anyway, you, you felt that um, this blood idea, if, if, you, if you're tracking Jews by blood, that sort of becomes a little bit racist. Um, so, don't, doesn't that put us back to who's, who, who's ra being raised as a Jew? So, I mean, that's, uh, that's um, uh, thank you for remembering. Oversimplifying, oversimplifying. Right, yeah, but thank you for remembering a little bit of what I was trying to say. Yeah, I, I, um, a, I support the idea that we should continue with matrilineal descent as the uh, determiner of, of Jewish identity. And specifically by rejecting patrilineal descent, which is, you know, the, the, the argument is the argument. I mean, let's be very clear. The argument in the reform and the reconstructionist and whoever other progressive movements that want to, uh, you know, reestablish patrilineal descent, they're not taking away matrilineal descent. That in biblical times, it was, it was one or the other, right? So patrilineal descent was the determiner. And the woman was subsumed under the man's uh, authority as the head of the family. So what they what they argue is that we're now that we should be much more egalitarian, and that if we're egalitarian in other um, realms, we should be egalitarian in this realm, and we should have patrilineal and matrilineal. Either one is good. Um, my what what I was saying that that you were kind of remain. I, I I wasn't using so much blood. Who knows what I said back then. Um, but, but it's not about your DNA is what I'm saying. It's not a genetic determiner. The fact that your father does not determine your Jewish identity according to the way the tradition has been for the last 2000 years or more is a very powerful statement as far as I'm concerned of saying, no, Judaism has nothing to do with your genes. If it had to do with your genes, then of course, if your father was Jewish, you would have an equal claim to be Jewish just like if your mother was Jewish. But it's not about genes; it's about birth. So, for instance, does that sound like it's, it's like it's like it's, it's it doesn't you know doesn't make any sense? So, the mother's genes are good, but the father's genes are not good. No, it's the birth that determines your Jewish identity. For instance, what if a woman 
had a, um, you know, an egg uh, that wasn't her egg implanted in her that was fertilized. And she carried that fertilized egg to uh, complete, uh, uh, you know, uh, conception and, and then uh, labor, whatever you call that thing, partridge, whatever it's called. Um, and she gives birth to that baby. That baby has no genetic material from the mother or from the father. The baby is Jewish because she gave birth to the baby. So this is, to me, a very powerful kind of statement. That's why conversion works. Because if it was about genes, nobody would be able to convert to be a Jew if, if you didn't have Jewish genes, if you didn't have Jewish blood someplace, you know, to use blood in that kind of sense, right? The reason you can convert to Judaism is because we create a womb that you get born out of. It's called a mikvah. The mikvah is the womb that, that, uh, that is the, with the amniotic fluid, so to speak, the, the living waters that, that you emerge from. And anybody then could possibly theoretically be born into the Jewish people. So it's that, to me, it's that kind of very primal determiner uh, that makes sense and that keeps us away from any kind of, uh, <clears throat> you know, suspect genetic identity policies and uh, which are alive and well, you know, in the Orthodox community, they really think about, about Jewish blood and Jewish genes. And I think it's absolutely a, a horror. Um, there's pushback on the, the example I gave. It used to be absolutely taken for granted that the birth mother determines the Jewish identity of the kid. Um, and, you know, you could conceivably have non-Jewish genetic material completely, and yet the mother carried the, the baby and so on. Um, you know, surrogate mothers, right? Whatever it is, all those kinds of things. Um, now there's pushback. Why? Because Orthodox Judaism is becoming more and more racist. So now there's pushback. No, it's got to be a Jewish gene. It's got to be a Jewish seed uh, in order for, uh, uh, for, for, the, for the baby to be considered Jewish. Um, so some rabbis are changing that was the settled opinion. And now there's, there's, there's a, a shift among certain rabbis. I think it's a horror. I think it's a, I think it's a tragedy. But, you know, I'm, I'm stuck in the middle because the, certainly the reform and the reconstruction movements don't think the way I'm thinking. And uh, many conservative rabbis no longer want to stand, stand up for that kind of tradition. And the Orthodox are becoming racist. So I don't know what's going to happen. Josie, yeah. Um, wow. <laughs> I thought part of the argument was simple um, statistics that if Jews accept patrilineal descent, we'd have a lot more Jews. That's yeah, that's, the, that's one of the practical reasons. That's one of the, you know, the, the, the realistic pressures that are going on. We don't want to disappear. So we start looking around for ways to increase our numbers. Um, you've got other people, you know, now that self-identification is a, is a concept that's becoming more and more common, right? Where people have the right to define who they are, period, without answering to anybody else. You now, and then sometimes it gets a little uh, uh, weird and then there's pushback. We had that ridiculous case uh, a few years ago of a, a, a woman who was the head of the NAACP chapter Oh, um, and she really in, in Oregon or someplace. And she said, I, I'm black. And she wasn't black. So, uh, um, you know, so then there was pushback because she was usurping. She was using her own white privilege, you know, to sort of like imperialistically take over somebody else's, some other group's identity. So that smacked, you know, as something bad. But on the other hand, we're very, very much open these days. Um, and I, you know, I, 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 I see that and I accept that to a certain degree. I don't know that I completely understand what the parameters are, but self-identification is much, much more uh, powerful an idea today. We do it in, for instance, in sexual identity. So that argument would say, if I say I'm a Jew, I'm a Jew. Mm -hmm. Who are you to say no? And there's a tremendous, there's a, tre not a tremendous, but there certainly is a, a vocal group of people um, that feel that way, you know, rabbis are, you know, just power hungry, you know, uh, terrible people. 
and why the rabbis think that they can decide who's a Jew and who isn't a Jew. Um, you know, and uh, people feel that this is up to every single person uh, to decide on their own. Is that going to be the way it's going to develop? I don't know. I have no idea. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not a soothsayer. I'm not a uh, fortune teller. I do not know how the future will develop. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. Okay, anyway, what I'm saying, suggesting in our Gemara is that this is part of what this Gemara's uh, um, statements are reflecting. These are residues of those, um, those stresses and strains that, that uh, uh, um, the people uh, um, have, uh, you know, we're, we're still undergoing. Then we have this idea of families uh, fighting it out, right? That mishpachot uh, midgarot zobazo, the families would would uh, vie with each other, would compete with each other. So, what's the illusion that they're talking about there? Why should Judah get uh, credit uh, for uh, for uh, for Mordechai? So, I caused Mordechai to be born because King David did not kill Shimi ben Geva. Okay, so do we have an explanation? Fifty nine. Go ahead. Yeah, but you have to unmute. Yep. Shimi deserved to be executed for cursing King David, yet David did not kill him. That's from Samuel and Kings. Right. So what they're saying is, look at how benevolent we are. Look at what, what uh, nice, uh, um, you know, kind, uh, uh, you know, people we are. If it weren't for, for King David's, um, you know, magnanimity, there wouldn't be a Mordechai. Right? So this again... And then what does Benjamin answer? He is in fact descended from me. Right. In other words, just you know, cut the homiletics and cut all that stuff. Where did he descend from? He's a Benjaminite. So let's get let's just be factually accurate and 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 stop the other stuff. Um, but what we have in the in this kind of back and forth <laughs> is um Again, I would say a kind of a uh, reflection of both historical reality and also uh, um, historical memory. Giving uh, Judah the uh, credit for not uh, destroying uh, a remnant of Benjamin is in a certain sense historically accurate there would be no Benjamin if it weren't for Judah. Benjamin got swallowed up by Judah, it's true, but on a, you know, in terms of physical you know, survival of people, if Benjamin hadn't been a secondary tribe that had been sort of overtaken by the tribe of Judah, Benjamin would have gone the way of Zebulun and Naphtali and God and all the other ones. They would have disappeared. So in a certain sense, this is a kind of a legend way of talking about the fact that Benjamin only can still have whatever shreds of, 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 uh, of, of uh, you know, uh, uh, continued existence, thanks to the fact that they, uh, at the, you know, they were at the mercy of Judah and Judah you know, took them in. So there's that kind of uh, reality. The second is back to the story I mentioned about Saul, right? Saul was also a generous guy. Saul doesn't kill somebody who deserves to be killed. David doesn't kill somebody who deserves to be killed. But for Saul, it's a tragedy, right? For Saul, he doesn't kill the king of Amalek who deserved to be killed. And as a result, he brings more suffering on the Jewish people. David is kind and magnanimous and doesn't kill somebody who, who deserved to be killed, who was considered a, 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 a you know, a rebellion against, a, re, a rebel against the, the monarchy. That's a capital crime. And as a result of his magnanimity, the Jewish people are saved. So again, we get these flipping back and forth. Okay. Keep going. Rava. Rava says, the congregation of Israel said the opposite. That is, they assigned the blame, not the credit, for Mordecai's birth to Judah and Benjamin. 
since they considered Mordecai the source of their troubles. They said, look what a Judahite did to me and what a Benjaminite paid me. What a Judahite did to me. Now we're on 13A1. For King David, who was from the tribe of Judah, did not kill Shimei, from whom descended Mordecai, who provoked Haman, Haman by not bowing down to him, thereby causing our troubles. And what a Benjamin paid me for Saul, who was from the tribe of Benjamin, did not kill Agag, from whom descended Haman, who oppresses the Jews. <clears throat> okay, so a pox on both of on both on sides. Both your houses. Right? This is this is Amcha, right? This is the Hoi Poloi. They're all saying, I don't care, they're both no good. Right? What do we need these tsaras for? They're both uh, causing us tsaras. Saul caused us tsaras by not uh, destroying uh, uh, Amalek when he had the chance. And then Haim, uh, and then Mordechai, can't tell the difference between Haman and Mordechai. Um, and then Mordechai makes it worse by stirring the pot, by provoking Haman. Once Haman is, is, is around, and we and we lost our chance uh, to kill him, so then leave him alone, you know. Leave, the, stop poking the uh, uh, you know the the beast, and yet Mordechai does that. So you know why you know so there's resentment from on either side. Okay, this is uh, I think also astutely reading the way many people see things. Okay. Rabbi Yochanan. No, I can't hear a word. I had just undone that, sorry. Rabbi Yochanan offers yet a different resolution to the contradiction. Rabbi Yochanan said, Mordechai <clears throat> actually descended from the tribe of Benjamin. So why is he called a Judahite? Because he repudiated idolatry by not bowing down to Haman, who made himself an object of worship. For whoever repudiates idolatry is called a Judahite. As it is written regarding Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they are Judahites. They do not serve you, Nebuchadnezzar's gods, and they do not bow down to the golden image you erected. <clears throat> okay. So here we get, you know, it's sort of like um, Lenny Bruce, right? Lenny Bruce used to have a comedy routine about what's Jewish and what's not Jewish, right? And, and you know, anybody who lives in New York is Jewish, right? Uh, or if you eat a bagel, you're Jewish, right? He had certain kind of markers. I don't remember the whole, you know, comedy routine, but I can't hear a word you're saying, Bill. Can still can't hear you. I know I'm doing that by accident. I must have I'm something with the, with the, with the cursor. Uh, he also said, if you're, if you're from, uh, I don't know, I'll say North Dakota, you can't be Jewish, even if you're Jewish. Right, right. So there's some, you know, whatever the criteria are. Um, so here the, 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 uh, uh, the Gemara is saying, um, and this is who? Uh, Rav Yehuda? Uh, Yochanan. Rav Yochanan. <clears throat> I mean, Yehuda would be a good name for this. He um, says, what's a Jew? A Jew is somebody who, who uh, rejects idolatry. So he's called a Jew, a Yehudi, because he, of course, rejected idolatry. Yeah. They, the very same thing that we just had a second ago, that the, that the Jews themselves are resenting him for being too Jewish, right? He's too Jewish. He's, you know, sticking it to, uh, to Hamant. And if you just, instead of like knowing his place, now we have the opposite kind of ca uh, uh, characterization. He's the real Jew because he's the one who refuses to go along, refuses to, uh, uh, to go with the flow and, and uh, who rejects uh, idolatry, that's a real Jew. Um, of course, when he's doing, when he's saying that, he's, he's as I said, touching on what we were saying uh, a little while ago, this name Jew becomes not a tribal identifier, but a Jewish people identifier, right? It becomes uh, a much broader term, and then it can encompass many other kinds of associations. Let's look at note seven. Note seven. <clears throat> there is a dispute, excuse me, see San Edrin 93b between Rabbi Elazar and Rabbi Shmuel ben Bar Nachmani, whether Hanani and Mishael and Azariah were from the tribe of Judah. Our Gemara follows the view that they were not from the tribe of Judah. Accordingly, the reverse refers to them as Judahites, 
because, as the verse concludes, they repudiated idolatry. Maharsha, however, suggests that our Gemara might even follow the opinion that they were from the tribe of Judah. But since it is apparently of no consequence to us that they were from the tribe of Judah, there was no need for the verse to mention it unless it meant to teach us something. The Gemara therefore derives from this verse that whoever repudiates idolatry is called a Judahite. <clears throat> so, so the two ways of reading it, he's an honorary, they were honorary Judahites. Was, they weren't really from the tribe of Judah. This, of course, is like I say, it's it, like we have here in the note, this was from the book of Daniel. So this is right after uh, the, uh, um, the Babylonian uh, um, exile. And uh, these are three people who are uh, faithful to Judaism, faithful to the, to the Jewish God. Um, but the other way of reading it is, yes, they really did come from the tribe of Judah. And this is when we sort of say, and they really, they were real Jews, mm -hmm. right? They were Jews, but they weren't just Jews by name. They were real Jews. This is what a real Jew is. A real Jew is a person who won't bow down to an idol, right? So, uh, it's, so it's not so much what their real tribal identification was, but um, the idea that this is what a Jew is supposed to be and that we should, what we should all be aspiring uh, to be. Okay. Uh, moving right along. Moving right along. Can I ask a question? Why not? <laughs> what do the British Jews do? Do they bow to the queen? Um, I, uh, I think that they probably do. I think that it's understood that it's a, it's a, it's not a, uh, it's not a, a religious, even though the, she's the head of the church, um, she's not being bowed down to she, as, as a religious figure or as a God, she's being bowed, bowed to at as, at as, as a respectful gesture, just like I think in Japan. Um, you know, each person bows down to the other or whatever it is, or I don't know exactly what the etiquette is, but if the bowing is not about worship, if the bowing is about, uh, you know, uh, respect, I mean, we, we bow to, uh, you know, to people of, of, you know, of, of stat, you know, great standing, um, you know, we stand up for people bowing down, you know, nodding your head, sort of, you know, giving a little bit of a sense of, of, uh, of, of respect, that's okay. I mean, the, what, what was you know, wrong, uh, according to the story is that Haman says, uh, Haman says bow down uh, to me because I am you know, uh, uh, of, you know, some kind of divine standing and uh, I have absolute power. And uh, you know, Mordechai says no. Rabbi? Uh, yeah, where I, Rich, yes. Wouldn't, uh, I would think Maimonides would have had the same problem. And I wonder what he would have said about it. What do you mean Maimonides would have the same problem? In the, um, you know, in the Muslim world. Yeah, Maimonides, uh, uh, you know, basically tried to find the most liberal Muslim situation that he could in order to live. He had a whole personal history that was quite difficult. Um, and, uh, you know, it, this is, it, you know, it's a, it's a very fraught question. Do you do you sacrifice your life for every little thing? You know, do you do you go along with things to a certain degree in order to save your life? I mean, he gives all these uh, suggestions to uh, uh, to you know to the, the Jews of Yemen. You know that uh, get out when you can. You know, buy time, but get out, and that's what he did. You know, he he was uh, in a very fundamentalist Muslim uh, uh, society and scholars. Um, seriously uh, think that he and, uh, and his family were publicly uh, Muslims while they were uh, Jews in secret for a while until he was able to leave and move east. And he finally got you know, the, to, to Egypt where he was able to be a, a Jew, um, you know, a full-fledged uh, you know, Jew. So yeah, this is uh, the Maimonides' discussions of this created a, a gigantic uh, literature because unfortunately this was real, a real problem in many many uh, places. How how uh, you know obviously the fam the famous phenomenon is the conversos, um, which is way after Maimonides' time, but they were not the first ones. This was happening all over the place. Um, 
and Jews had to, you know, negotiate that that uh, that tension, you know, between when do I become a martyr, and when do I do anything I can at the moment to save my life, and hold on, and hope for the best. So and uh, you know, many many times, probably most times, if you held on, you saved your life. But in the end, Judaism got lost. Right. The the sometimes people were able to finally extricate themselves and leave. The Converso uh, situation um, had many examples of people who then were able to run away from Spain and Portugal to Holland. Right. That's why Amsterdam became such an important place um, to, to, to uh, Naples and all kinds of other places like that. Um, and uh, sometimes they were able to return to Judaism. Um, Many times the generations just kept on going in that kind of like murky halfway kind of situation until they even forgot what what they were what the, why they were doing what they were doing. I mean, people are coming back to Judaism as I, as we speak from from hundreds of years of that kind of like limbo existence of being you know trying to keep Jewish life going secretly while in in public being something else. Is, and it's not only a Christian thing, it's also a Muslim thing. There's a, there's a whole uh, um, uh, Jewish um, Persian uh, community that for years, for you know, a couple hundred years was actually publicly Muslim and then uh, uh, returned to, to being Jews. And they have a kind of a, a, an interesting I'm not an expert at it, but they have an interesting kind of like shaky uh, identity among the rest of the uh, the rest of the Persian Jews. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, when Rabbi Shimon Ben Pazi introduced his lecture on Chronicles, he said the following: All of your words, all of your words, Chronicles are one and we know how to interpret them. Oh, sorry, I've got to go up above. Um, the Gemara cites an exposition of Rabbi Shimon ben Pazi, which includes this principle that whoever repudiates idolatry is called a Judahite. When Rabbi Shimon ben Pazi introduced his lecture on Chronicles, he said the following, all of your words, Chronicles, are one, and we know how to interpret them. That is, many names mentioned in Chronicles actually refer to a single person. And though this is not always apparent from the text, we are able through careful analysis to expound the text and discover its true meaning. Rabbi Shimon Bonpazi illustrates this with an analysis of the following verse in Chronicles. And his wife, Yehudiah, bore Yered, the father of Gedor, and Hever, the father of Soho, and Yekusiel, the father of Noach. And these are the sons of Bisya, the daughter of Pharaoh, whom Mered took. Rabbi Shimon Mampazi analyzed this verse. Why does this verse call her Yehudiah if she was in fact Bisya, the daughter of Pharaoh, as the verse later states? Because she repudiated idolatry, as it is written, and the daughter of Pharaoh went down to bathe by the river. And Rabbi Yochanan said an explanation of this verse, that she went down to cleanse herself from the idolatry of her father's house. Okay, so... Um... Okay, we have a, a, a long uh, kind of round, you know, a, a route to make the same point. Um, but uh, the other uh, point that, that we want to maybe pay attention to is that we have a name for the daughter of Pharaoh. Right? The daughter of Pharaoh is called Bitya. Right? Um, here in our, in our art scroll, you know, edition, it's Bitya. Sorry, I didn't, it, I didn't know it, that. That's okay. You have to, that's in the Hebrew, right? Um, right? B'nai Vitya, Bitya Bat Paro. So Bitya Bat Paro, the, the Bat is the first half of the name. She was Bat Paro, but she becomes Bat Ya. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right? We have the, also the name Batya. Right? Mm. Uh, um, so here it's Bitya, Batya, it's the same thing. So it means the daughter of God. So this daughter of Pharaoh 
chose not to follow her father's uh, traditions, but to embrace um, Judaism. So, and that's why we have here um, that uh, the, uh, um, the name that's given to her at the beginning of the verse is Yehudia, Jewess, right? Um, as opposed to her name Bitya, which comes later in the verse. So Rabbi Shimon ben Pazi says, why is she called a Yehudia? Because that's exactly what she did. A Yehudia is somebody who decides to be a Jew, who decides to reject idolatry and to embrace uh, um, the God of Israel. This bitya is not, if you look at the simple meaning of the, word, of the verses in, in, in Chronicles, um, when's, when is 929 getting to Chronicles? When's the 929 group uh, going to reach Chronicles? Oh, uh, we did it long ago. You did Chronicles already? Yeah. Even though it's yeah. the last thing in the Tanakh? Oh, then, then no. Then I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm confusing with something else. I think you're following the regular Jewish book. Yeah, yeah. Books, yeah. Right? yeah. So, did you finish Job yet? Uh, we just finished Job. We're in the process of, of moving into Ruth. Okay. All right. So you're almost there. You're almost there. Anyway, so if you follow what's going on in Chronicles, <clears throat> This Bitya is the daughter of a different pharaoh. This is not the pharaoh of the Exodus. But nevertheless, we have here an anachronistic uh, application of the name. And we take the daughter of pharaoh, just like pharaoh is a name that applies to pharaoh generation after generation. Now we're taking this particular Bitya and we apply her uh, name to the famous daughter of pharaoh, from the Exodus story, who had never given a name. She's not given a name in the Torah. So we take this name and she, this becomes the name that we have in our tradition for the woman who courageously saves Moshe uh, from the Nile. So she is called Bitya and she's given this idea that she obviously rejected her father's order to kill uh, the, the uh, Jewish babies. What's the term for Jewish that's used in that story? Hebrew, right? She saw Hebrew. that it was a Hebrew baby, <clears throat> right? Ivri. Um, when, when Jonah is in the, the, uh, the boat um, with the storm and everybody's praying to their own God and then they, he's sleeping and they go, who are you? Where, 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 where? He goes, Ivri Anochi. He doesn't say Yehudi Anochi because there's no such term yet. Um, so um, anyway, in the Exodus story, there is no term like that, Yudia, or so on. But um, the Gemara applies one daughter of Pharaoh's uh, uh, name back into the story of the Exodus. And they imagine that her you know, saving the baby is obviously a, a, a resistance against her father and a rejection of her father's idolatry. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The verse states that Pharaoh's daughter bore Yered, Hever, and Yechutiel. As these three names all referred to Moses, Rabbi Shimon ben Pazi questions the wording of the verse. Wait, Did you know what? Before, before we go on, let's look. It's a little intri intriguing. Let's look at note 12. Note 12. Uh, she immersed herself for the sake of becoming a proselyte. That's Rashi's interpretation. Merome Sade asked what the purpose of this immersion was, since at that time, before the giving of the Torah at Sinai, there was no concept of becoming a Jew through immersion. He suggests that this immersion was of a different nature, namely the immersion required when one becomes a Baal Tshuva, to cleanse himself of his sins. So too, Pharaoh's daughter immersed herself to cleanse herself of idolatry. Right. So if you look at this, on the one hand, it's ridiculous. Um, with all, you know, with, with literally and seriously, with all due respect to the Merome Sade. Merome Sade was the Naftali Tzvi Uda Berlin, the Metziv. He was the, the head of the Velozhin Yeshiva. Ah. So, um, so he knows what he's talking about. But if you look at it superficially, he's just running around in circles. Right? He says, well, it can't be that she's immersing herself to be a convert because immersion to be a convert what didn't exist yet. Yeah. So what does he tell you instead? Well, she's following the Shulchan Aruch. Well, guess what? The Shulchan Aruch also doesn't exist yet. 
you know, so, so um, you know, in a certain sense, what he's saying, like I said, sounds ridiculous, but it's not ridiculous. It's actually a very, very, I think, a very astute and, and uh, important observation. Um, now, in terms of the story itself, um, it's, not, it's not that important, you know, how we read it. But if we imagine this person, if we imagine this person, and, and to a certain extent, the, 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 the germane, uh, it, you know, uh, uh, speculation is, is quite important and deep. Her resistance to her father, if we start getting into her head, if we start trying to imagine in throughout history, in different places, in different situations, when a person has such a powerful uh, uh, cultural, societal, and familial pressure to, to think a certain way, to be a certain way, and then they don't do it, then they move off in another direction, right? That kind of really profound reinvention of the self. That's what the Maromi Sada is, is calling a, being a Balchuva. That's what it means to repent. That's actually what we're, today is the beginning of, of Elul. This is Rosh Chodesh Elul, the first of the two days of Rosh Chodesh Elul. Uh, we have one month till Rosh Hashanah. Um, but this is, what it, this is what it really is. And it goes back to what I was saying before about what immersion in a mikveh is. It's a rebirth. It's this, what, what they're imagining here is this woman struggling with and taking to heart that she needs to be a different person. She needs to be somebody else, somebody new. She can't just be the follower and the product of her father's uh, um, ideas and her father's actions and policies. She sees something very different. And the water for her is necessary, the immersion in that water to emerge out of that water to be a new person. You know, we, in, in, to be somebody freshly born, to, to, uh, um, you know, to take to oneself um, an identity that is all one's own and, and not what would you have before. So yeah, it's not officially conversion to being a Jew. That's an anachronistic idea, but the anachronism is not so far off, right? The anachronism simply means that later on, this was recognized as what the process really entailed. Okay. So now let's go again. Let's start from the verse states. The verse states that Pharaoh's daughter bore Yered, Hever, and Yechutiel. These... Say again? Yechutiel. Yechutiel. As these three names all refer to Moses, see the Gemara below, Rabbi Shimon ben Pazi questions the wording of the verse. Did she bear Moses? But she only raised him. This verse teaches teaches you that whoever raises an orphan boy or girl in his house, scripture considered it as if he gave birth to him. Moses, who had to be separated from his parents because of Pharaoh's degree, was considered an orphan. Since Pharaoh's daughter raised him, the verse states that she bore him. <clears throat> okay, so this is a key text um, in contemporary discussions about adoption. Right. This is uh, adoption is, is not understood um, as an official kind of process uh, in, in ancient times. Um, you, know, you, could, you could have a, you know, somebody that was your ward, so to speak, somebody that was under your beneficent control and so on. But the idea that we have today that you can adopt a child to be your child um, is uh, legally speaking something that, that's much more uh, modern. But this text uh, is uh, a text that, that opens the way to that. She is the one who raised him. No, she isn't the biological mother, but she's the one who raised him. And therefore she's called here the one who is his, um, his, his birth mother. Um, because she, she gave him life. She saved his life. And then she nurtured him and she made sure that he stayed alive. Um, I've pointed it out many times. What is Moshe's name? 
you know, what's the color of, of uh, you know, U.S. Grant's white horse? <laughs> Moshe's name is Moshe, right? Moshe's name is, according to the Torah, a name given to him by Pharaoh's daughter, and it means ki min mishitiu, because I pulled him out of the water. So that's the word Moshe. So, you know, then Bible scholars mention that, that uh, Mose is an Egyptian name. Maybe it doesn't mean that. It doesn't matter. For the Torah, the name of Moshe is the constant reminder that he is the one saved by Pharaoh's daughter. We have no inkling of what the name was that Yocheved and Amram, his birth parents, his, his Israelite Hebrew parents, they probably gave him a name. He was there with them for three months. The Torah tells us that they hid him for three months. Did they give him a name? Did they not give him a name? It's another maybe interesting idea since they knew that they would have to uh, uh, relinquish him. But he, his only name, his full Jewish name, when he gets called to the Torah, right? His name is Moshe. That's this name given by his adoptive Egyptian mother. We should never forget that. Okay. Rabbi Shimon ben Pazi continues his interpretation of the verse, explaining how all the names recorded as Bitya's children actually refer to Moses. Yered, this is actually Moses. And why was he called Yered in this verse? Because manna came down from the heavens for Israel in his days. Moses was also called Gedor in this verse because he fenced in the breaches of Israel. Moses was also called Hever in this verse because he connected Israel to their father in heaven. That is, he served as the link between God and Israel. Moses was also called Soho in this verse because he was like a protective covering for Israel and that he saved them from punishment through his prayers. Moses was also called Yehutiel in this verse because Israel looked with hope towards God in his days. Moses was also called Zanoach in this verse because he cast off the sins of Israel. That is because of his prayers, God forgave Israel. Okay, so we have here a similar idea to what we had before with Mordechai, where the names are not the names of, of specific people, but they're always referring back to the same person because of different qualities or different actions that they perform. So here we have plays on words. These are all puns. These are all uh, um, you know, based on, on the similarity of the word. The word yared is the, like the word yarad, to go down, to descend. So the manna descended from heaven, thanks to Moses. So he's therefore called the one who brought down um, the manna. Uh, interesting that he that, that they didn't use a different term because well, we uh, you know an obvious one he brought down the Torah from from yeah, heaven yeah. right but that's not what's used here okay so that's that's one thing then we have um, gedor right gedor comes from the word gader gader means a fence uh, so he was the one who uh, fenced in made sure that that uh, um, you know he limited. Um, Israel's uh, um, uh, proclivity to, uh, uh, to do the wrong thing. Um, we have, uh, uh, okay, uh, chever, like the word chaver, which means a friend, but the word, uh, the word friend itself comes from the word chibur, to be connected, be connected together. A friend is somebody who's connected to, to the other person. So, uh, He's the person who connected uh, the Jewish people uh, to God. And then we have Soho, like the word Sukkah, right? A Sukkah is a protective covering. So he was the one who stood up for, for, for Israel in so many places in the Torah, right? When Israel is about to be destroyed by, a, by an irate, furious God, Moses steps into the breach and Moses pleads for the Jewish people and saves the Jewish people. So he's like a sukkah. And that's, of course, a little ironic because sukkah, who what's the original sukkah? Tabernacle. This original sukkah is God. 
God is the original Sukkot. The reason that we stay in Sukkot, the reason that we observe the holiday of Sukkot is because God was our Sukkah. God took care of us in the, in the, in the wilderness, right? With the clouds of glory. When we say every evening, spread over us your Sukkah of peace. So God is the Sukkah. And now we have a kind of a, 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 an ironic twist where Moses is our Sukkah against God. Right? God is supposed to be our protective presence, but that protective presence is a very volatile uh, force. And if we mess with that protective presence, then we can really get fried, literally. And Moses then becomes the protective presence against the protective presence. So that's uh, um, Soho. Then we have Yekuti El. So Yekuti El is, they looked with hope um, to uh, uh, God. And the word Yekuti El is the word, the Kuf and the Vav is um, like the word Tikva, right? Right, a Tikva is hope. Right, and it comes with the root kuf vav, which is a kav, a line. Kave el Hashem, chazak ve'ametz libecha ve'kave el Hashem. We're going to begin saying Psalm 27 tomorrow, uh, tonight. Uh, and that's for the month of Elul through Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. Hope to God, or draw a bead toward God, a, a line, right? Line yourself up, align yourself with God. So Yekutiel is the one who had a line to God. El is obviously God, and the Yekuti is from the word Kav. So he taught us um, to hope in God. Um, just to, since we're on a kind of a little bit of a high holiday uh, uh, preparation, um, I mentioned before that what is the, the womb that a person enters into in order to be born out of that womb to become a Jew or to become a new person, the mikveh, mikveh. right? So the mikveh has the kuf and the vav in there also. So the mikveh is a place, yikavu amayim, as God says at the beginning of creation. There it means let them all line up together, let them come together and be collected in one place. So a mikveh is a place that collects the waters that the rainwaters or the waters of a stream, right? A body of water that's been collected together. And then Rabbi Akiva says, um, it says, there's a verse, mikveh Yisrael Hashem, that God is Israel's hope, right? That we always hope in, in God. And then he says, no, let's read it that God is Israel's mikveh, right? We immerse ourselves in the waters of God, God surrounds us and God gives us fresh, new, purified life. So God should be imagined as a kind of a mikveh. The, the original meaning is God is our hope, but it's all connected. Yeah, David. These names for Moshe, I've not heard them before. The rabbis talk about them as though they're in common knowledge. And I was just wondering, that's because you haven't learned the uh, chronicles in the in the in the, the last. This Come is all to... about just taking verses from different parts of scripture. Chronicles is a pretty neglected uh, book, um, and all they're doing they're they're unpacking a verse in Chronicles. They're not assuming that anybody knows this until they tell them. Okay. So, Bill, when are you starting Chronicles? <laughs> uh, a couple of couple of weeks or a couple of months. I'm not sure. Okay. Right. We'll have to plug in. Wow. Who, who's counting? Yeah. Who's counting? So, every, every other Sunday at uh, 12 o'clock. If, if David doesn't recognize this, how much more in the dark are those of us who don't know Hebrew? If you don't okay. know Hebrew, you're really depending on translations Absolutely. all the way through. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's true. All of these in Hebrew, it's called Lashon no Fela Lashon. Right, the language or the tongue falls upon the tongue. One language falls upon another language. One term falls onto the other term. It's because they sound alike. That's the idea of punning. 
That's the idea of a mishak milim, the you know, word games. You have to be able to play with the words. You have to know the words. You have to know what they what their roots are, what they sound like. Right. And this was a, this was a delight for the for the rabbis for sure. This is something that they Maybe. took great took great, not just not that they enjoyed it. They took great pleasure that this was part of what the Torah could be. The Torah, you know, could be, you know, just in terms of its language, uh, playfully manipulated. Okay, you know what? We're going to stop here. We'll continue okay. next time. Um, we, have, we have a few pages left of 13. Um, so probably uh, we're not going to finish it next time. But probably next time somebody should remind me to remind you to send yes, me a note so I can send you the next pages. Okay. Okay. Yep. Good. All right. Yep. Stay safe, everybody.